Hey everyone, I'm Jordy, the Bible School and Tech Director here, and welcome or welcome back to Impact Life Church's online experience. After the message, please take a moment to like or subscribe, but most importantly, we hope that this message inspires you to impact this generation for Jesus. The Word of God has given you free and open access to His grace through your union with Jesus the Messiah. So let me ask you this, what do you have now? What kind of access do you have to the grace of God? It is open and it's a complete free access. So does that mean, is there a lock on it? Is it hidden from you? Is it, you know, hiding itself away from you, you know, because he doesn't like the way that you acted today? No, it is a completely open and it's completely free access. Now, how do you get it? Through your union with Jesus. Jamie. Anyway, so <laughs> I love that girl. Shay, thank you for sharing that. Where are you again, Shay? I just, oh man, I love that girl. Uh, I mean, I can tell you from my perspective, when I first met Shay Thompson, I mean, she came to youth when she, I think grade eight though, you like was the first time you walked into our building. Shay was that kind of the youth kid that like, and what we really emphasize in youth is that we are over the top uh, to love. We are over the top just to, to show the goodness and the kindness of Jesus, no matter who walks in those doors. And so I remember Shay kind of stepping out with her cousin at the time, opened the door to the car and we're just, Hey, so good to see you. We jumped on her and she's kind of the, Oh Jesus, what, like, what, what am I doing here? Why are they hugging me? Why are you touching me? It, it, it's just so cool to see. I mean, not that we're just going to bombard somebody and jump all over them dog pile style. But you can just see what the love of God is able and capable of doing. This girl is now preaching the gospel. Like, no, just, I need you to see this for a sec, that you have no idea the people that you reach. And uh, I mean, just, I'm, Shay, I'm so blessed to know you and that you're part of our life. This girl is amazing. I mean, to us, not only personally, she, she loves on our kids, but this girl now is going from school to school to teach kids about the love of God in the city of Red Deer. Dude, like, just think about this for a sec. This is... I mean, we, we say, Shay, way to follow the Lord, but you can see what Jesus can do with a life that all of a sudden, when they hear the goodness of God, you can't help but just fall in love with this man, Jesus. He is so kind, and it's the kindness of God that leads people to change. That's what it does, right? It's not the harshness or the wrath of God that's going to cause people to change. It's the goodness of God, as Romans 2, 4. So, Shay, I just want to boast on the Lord, but thank you, Shay, for being obedient and for doing what you're doing now. I mean, this girl, even with the microphone, would be kind of a little bit nervous at one point. But, man, look at this girl. Do you want to preach? No, you're, 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 oh, sit down, girl. She's got up. Just sit down. <laughs> oh, man, it's awesome. Well, we're so glad that you're here. I and, mean, you know, this is December 1st. And uh, man, we're just excited about this season. As many of you know, we celebrate the birth of our Savior this month. And man, we're thrilled. Although we know he was born in October, but we just celebrate in Christmas. But anyway, but anyway, so glad that you're here. John chapter 10, verse 10. We're going to continue on. This is our last day that I'm going to be talking about. This is living. And uh, we've had an, an awesome series. Pastor John and Ingrid, thank you so much for doing last weekend. Uh, they did Saturday night, the Q&A with Pastor Sheila. And then they did a service last weekend. And it was, it was awesome from where I was sitting. I was sitting in some heat last week, y'all. This is, did you know that people actually have, their winter is our summer? Did anybody know that? Or did we just assume that everybody froze in December? Man, they were laying out in 27 degree weather. I just thought, oh man, there's a, there's a place. And there, there, is a, there is a land that is good, full of, full of sun. Uh, but just thank you so much for running, running that last week. And they touched on faith. And uh, this morning, I'm going to just quickly tie up what we've been doing for the last seven weeks. And I trust just like what my wife said, that there is answers for you this morning. Uh, there is direction. There's clarity for you. And I want to encourage you, be in expectation. Lord, I'm getting some answers today. And you know, it's, it's so easy. You know what, you know, kind of what we do in, you know, the word holy, uh, for example, let me just want to tie this in. But the word holy just means set apart. And you know, for example, uh, yesterday I was at a, a, a pastor friend of mine in Calgary. They were celebrating their church, their third year of their church being in existence. And uh, so I went up there just to go celebrate and uh, just support them and love on them. And the, the guy that was there speaking, 
He just shared a few things, just talking about holy moments. And have you ever had a holy moment before where it's kind of a set-apart moment where God divinely speaks to you and says some things to you that just all of a sudden, oh God, I needed that. That is a set-apart moment. And I'm believing that this for you this morning is that, yeah, you made the effort to get here. Kudos to you. Well done on getting here. But don't just go, okay, I'm, I'm here doing my duty. This could be a potential holy moment for you where it's set apart that all of a sudden direction, answers, clarity come. Like, don't just kind of go, oh, it's church is what I do. Like, expect to meet him. When I come in, every time that I even come to this pulpit, I always go, Lord, I expect you to meet me here. And that I do that there's going to be words. And I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit is bigger than just what I know. <laughs> so you're not limited to what I say or what I don't say. You got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. God himself lives in you and he will quicken or he'll say something to you, custom make it for your exact situation that you're in. And I'm believing that for you this morning, especially the season that we're going into. This is a lot of time can be a depressing time for a lot of people, but for the believer, it should be a joyous time. Man, we're celebrating. There is a lost and dying world out there that need the joy that you and I have because we got Jesus. Amen. Okay, so John 10.10, 10, Jesus said these words, and I'm going to just take about five minutes to go over this, but we talked about real extensively, talking about the love of God that he has for us, and in John 10.10, 10, we talked about this is living for these past six weeks, and we use this scripture, it says a thief has one thing in mind. So what is a thief? What is he thinking about this exact moment? Seal, slaughter, destroy. This is what he wants to do. He wants to do that. Jesus went on to say, but I have come to give you everything in abundance. More than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. This is what Jesus came to give you and I. Right? And how many of you believe that? I believe this. So let me encourage you, if you're not experiencing or you're not seeing abundance more than you expect until it overflows, don't settle. Jesus paid way too high of a price for you just to enjoy life a little bit. He came to give you it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Is there going to be, is there going to be potential setbacks? Is there going to be things that come against you? Absolutely. That's promised to us. But that shouldn't throw you and I off of the life that Jesus came to give you and I. What do we do? All of a sudden something comes your way. God gives you and I the opportunity to rise above it and show that these little things, they don't move me. I'm unshakable, right? And so we talk real briefly about the love of God. And so 1 Corinthians 13, 13, this is where the, I've just been, you know, meditating on this verse for quite some time, thinking on it. And a lot of you know 1 Corinthians 13 being the love chapter, right? Talking about what love is, what love is not, you know, the characteristics of it. And really talk about what the divine love of God looks like. Well, at the very end of this chapter, the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit really through the Apostle Paul writes these words, and I think it's so profound. And I know you know this, but I want you to get it out of the Christianese world and just really in, bring it into your life that these are the triplets. This is what's going to remain forever. I mean, if you read through 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about knowledge. It talks about understanding. It talks about tongues. And all these things that are great now, at one point, sooner or later, eventually, when we get into this, the new heaven and new earth, those things will cease. But these three, we're talking here, these three remain. So faith, hope, and love. Um, this is a different translation. I've got to just read it a little bit differently. Faith, hope, and love. It says this, and now there, these three remain. Faith, which is abiding trust in God and his promise. Hope, confident expectation of e e eternal salvation. Love, unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. These three uh, remain the choicest of these graces is love now i want you and i to look at this but how many of you really we've talked a lot about love we talk a lot about faith we talk a lot about grace and what we tend to do is we tend to put these things on a pedestal right we tend to elevate these little things and what do we do with hope what do we do with hope other than you name your cat it or something what, what do you do with hope I hope it. you kind of put it down low, but what I want to do is I want to elevate hope again in your and my thinking because you and I, what we are living our life on, we are hoping, not wishing, wishful thinking, we are hoping for our eternal salvation to manifest, right? We're hoping for it. So I want to just take some time this, this morning to actually talk about hope and the importance of it. So this whole time that we've been talking, we hit on the love of God. So if you look at just this, uh, in Ephesians three seventeen. Real quickly, what are we supposed to be rooted and grounded in? In love, in how much God loves me. This is my root, 
right? This is what I'm established in. Why? So because how I, wherever I'm rooted is how I'm viewing and perceiving life. So no matter what comes my way, I always fall back to my automatic root system. So what happens when tough things come your way and all of a sudden you start freaking out? Don't just get upset that you freaked out. Go, why am I freaking out? Go back to the source. What's, what is holding me? What's my root? Am I worried about finances? Am I worried about what people think of me? Am I worried about I'm not going to get a job for the education I went through? Am I, what, what's, what is the root of your life? Right? And it's the good place to check it out is when tough things come, where do you run to? Right? A big, you know, family crisis hits. Where do you run? And this is what God's telling you and I. The moment you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you must now on intentionally, on purpose, get yourself rooted in how much God loves you. Jesus said this in John 59. He said, let my love nourish your hearts. This is the founding, this is the root of my life, is how much God loves me. And so why do we talk about love? Well, because Galatians 5 verse 6 it says, faith works, how? By love. Faith works by love. Everybody say it with me. Faith works works by love. And what does that mean? A lot of times I've always understood it and read it that faith works based on how well my love walk is towards other people. And there's some truth to that. Don't get me wrong. But more on purpose is how faith works by knowing how much God loves me. Man, when I know how much God loves me, faith is automatic. I trust you. When you know you're loved by God, I trust how much my God loves me. So that's what we spend a tremendous amount of time on, you and I getting rooted in the love that God has for us. And then we jumped into faith, and Pastor John and Ingrid so clearly and great, gracefully laid that out to you and I. What is faith? Right? And the purpose of faith in our lives. <clears throat> so love is my root for living. Faith is the lifestyle of the righteous. This is what we see over and over in the Bible, is that the faith, or sorry, the just, they shall live by faith. And I want to show you this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 in the Message Bible. It says, God has us right where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Are you hearing these words? Where does God have you right now? Right where he wants you. (laughs) And what does he want to do with you? What does God want to do with you? Shower. Shower. He's going to throw you in a shower full of what? Grace and kindness. Imagine that just smacking you in the face every time. When does he want to do this? Now and in the world to come. Did you know that this world that we're in is not the only world? So it's great that we can enjoy this, but there is another world on its way. And still, what is Jesus busy doing? He's going to shower more and more grace and kindness. Where you say, Lord, that's enough. He's like, no, shut up. You need more. This is what he does. This is who he is, right? Saving, now this is talking about salvation. I want to show you how you got into the kingdom of God. Saving is all whose idea? His idea, okay? And all his work, all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. <laughs> Isn't that good? So what did you do when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did you have to work for it? Did you have to show your church attendance before God would save you? No. Saving was all his idea. It was all his work. All you did was you heard the gospel preached. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He took all the sin of mankind on himself, died with it, rose again, and said, now you can accept me as as Lord and Savior. You become a brand new man that never existed before. Woo! That's the good news. And now who is this new man? He is the righteousness of God, or he is in right standing with God as if sin never existed before. I'm glad three people are excited about that. That is who you are today. You are in right standing with God as if you've never done a thing wrong. Man, and so this is what we see. All we do is to trust enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from... St- oh, go back, please. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. Say that with me. I don't play the major role. You know, every time you see a movie and you see the credits afterwards, if you see the credit of your life and all the good things that's taking place in it, who's the credit? Who's it all going to? Jesus. Period. You're not going to see, oh, and Joel did a lot of works, you know, to help it out. There is no credit, no add-ons. It's just Jesus. He gets all the credit. Well, what's my part then? I simply believe what he did and say thank you for it. (laughs) He gets the credits afterwards. Uh, It's a gift from God from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. 
goes on, finish it up there. It says, he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work that he has gotten us ready to do, work we had better been doing. So he called the whole thing. So you and I, we were brought into the kingdom by faith. The other translations say, by grace you were saved through faith, right? So you heard something, you believed it, and it was a credit to you for salvation. So since we were brought into the kingdom of God this way, guess how now we live in the kingdom of God? Do we go back living to our five physical senses? Okay, if I, I heard this and that Jesus did this for me, I can't save myself. Okay, Lord, I believe that, and he, he gave it to me. Now, do I go back to living and going, I got to make things work. I got, I got to earn healing. I got to earn the, the blessing of God. I got to earn peace. I got to earn joy in my life. That would be stupid. You were brought into the kingdom by faith. Now our whole existence is you and I living this life of faith, hearing what God did for us and simply believing it and getting our minds renewed to start thinking what's already been done for us rather than trying to attain it. So that's what we've been talking about faith and faith is powerful, right? Now what I want to do for the remainder of this time is talk to you and I about hope. Get this hope up. And I want to look at this in uh, Galatians, or sorry, Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 1. Now, I want to, before we do this, can you guys go back just to the slide that it says what hope is? I want to give you a definition for what I'm, you know, just spending time telling you what hope is. Hope is capturing with your imagination God's thoughts. Can we just say that together? What is hope? Hope is capturing with my imagination God's thoughts. Other tra- the other way you could say it is hope is strict. It's my imagination, right? It's, it's capturing something. Hope is, is imagination. Everybody say imagination. Imagination isn't just for my six-year-old and four-year-old boys that just have, you know, a cool idea what they can do with their dinosaurs, right? Or what they can do with the cat. Like they, they have an imagination of different things they can do. But that's not just for four and six-year-old boys. That is for you and I today. Get your hope up. <laughs> what are you imagining? What are you seeing? And because to be honest, everybody still uses their imagination to this day. Where did you park this morning? Do you know where you parked? How do you know that? <laughs> we walked all the way down that road. Yeah, yeah, I know. We're working on it, y'all. We're working on it. <laughs> Sorry, Matthew, you got to freeze your tail off. <laughs> but you remember, how do you know where you parked? Because you can see it. It's in your imagination. It's in your image. You saw where you parked your car. How remember your child bedroom your, when you were a kid? Does, remember what your bedroom looks like? How many windows did it have? None. <laughs> you grew up in a bombshell. This is a pretty rough crowd over here. They're, 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 they're a little bit hurt. They have to walk a long way. No bedrooms in my window. <laughs> or no bedroom. You know what I'm saying. No windows in my... Whatever. He threw me off. <laughs> but you remember that, don't you? Man, I do. I remember I had two windows. How do I know that? Because I got spanked and then brought to my bedroom. I remember it very clearly. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for that. I do, I do appreciate that. But it's, if you just think about it, you remember those things. Why? Because you have an imagination. How I many you remember the first car you drove? How was that thing looking? You had a nice one. I didn't. <laughs> right on. I remember the when I was, this is so funny. When I was about to get my car, uh, like I had to leave it at my grandparents' farm at the time. And uh, I was so excited. I turned 16. I got my license. And I'm like, yeah, I got to drive the car. And I remember I phoned my Opa, uh, who's in heaven today celebrating. But my Opa, I remember phoning him and saying, hey, I'm going to go pick up my car. And he said, yeah, Joel, a um, bit of an accident, bit of a bit of a problem with that. And uh, he actually he was cleaning out the garage that they had, and he put it in neutral to kind of roll it out so he could clean it. And he they didn't realize there was a little bit of a decline, so he pushed the car, and it swung all the way down their driveway. They have a big, you know, kind of a well house area. The door flew right off; it bent it backwards, and uh, I have no door. But, but when you're 16, doors are overrated. Who needs a door to drive a car? I don't. I'm fine. But uh, anyway, so we found eventually, I think my, my uncle found a, a, a door for me. So I had a black Buick Regal with a white door from the driver's side. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I was, I was the real deal in high school. I remember finally driving that thing. And not only that, the heater didn't work. So I don't know, every morning I had to, you know, had the long extension cord. And then I had to plug in my parents, my mom's hair dryer. 
And then at every red light, I had to scrape the car because there was, and not only that, there was no power steering in it. I don't know if you guys actually like me or not. Or can we just, did you want to get rid of me? I'm just wondering. Because you know, on one drive to school, one of the first days when I got it, I hit two parked cars in one day. <laughs> Why? I couldn't see for one. And I can't turn because, I mean, I wasn't hitting the gym enough, obviously. But anyways, it was a pretty little rough little deal. I'm fine, just my imagination's hurting. But it's, it's okay. <laughs> point being is you remember all these things. Why? Because you have an imagination given to you by God. Right? Right? You can see it. (laughs) Okay. I'm sure everybody had better cars or worse cars than I thought. I get that. But now look at Hebrews 11 verse 1. It says these words, and we know these verses, but it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, right from here, you can get faith's definition, but also in here, if you study and look closely enough, you can also see what hope is as well. So faith, first of all, faith is what? Substance. Everybody say substance. So it's not nothing. Faith is substance of things that you hope for. So if faith is a substance of things hoped for, it means that hope now is a positive picture that you get from the word that's in front of you. Faith has to give substance to something. So hope isn't just kind of a wish, oh, this would be nice to see sometime. Hope is getting a clear picture from the Word of God and getting it in front of your eyes to see it. Because without hope, faith is useless. People talk about faith. That's great, but you cannot talk about faith apart from hope. They work together because faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if there's no hope, faith has nothing to give substance to. So you and I, we need to get our hope up again. Now, the next part it is, faith is also evidence of things, what? Not seen. So that means hope deals with the unseen realm. So faith said, or faith is the evidence of things, hope, not, sorry, evidence of things not seen. It doesn't say faith is the evidence of things not real. It says of things not seen. There is a whole other world that you cannot see with these eyes. And this is why faith is so important because faith's eye sees what God's word says and goes, I believe that. How do you know you're going to heaven? Have you ever seen heaven? No. (laughs) But how do you know you're going? You you can see it on the inside. There's something more. Right? That's really hope. So hope now, (laughs) as I said, it deals with things that are the unseen. Faith only brings into reality what I've hoped for what I've positively seen in my imagination. Hope really is the activator. Hope really gets the picture. And this is one thing that I just heard, you know, when we were in holidays, just spending some time thinking, you do not have a faith problem. Pastor John and Ingrid said that last week, I believe it was, that faith is not your problem. What could be your problem? Hope. Hope, You could have a hope problem. What's that? You don't have a clear picture of what the word of God says to be true for you. And so what's happening? You're, th- um, you're throwing your faith at something, but there's no picture for it to latch onto and make it happen in your life. You don't have a faith problem. Your faith is working. Everybody say, my faith is working. It's, it's working. You don't have to worry about how do I get this faith to go? No, the same way you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you saw Jesus hanging on the tree. Now, how many of you were there when he died? I wasn't there, but I can see it in my heart. I can see him hanging on that tree and looking at me and say, you. What does that do? It makes me respond and go, I believe that. What is that? You've got a picture. Hope was elevated in front of you and you just went, I believe that, Jesus. I believe it. And immediately, salvation became yours. Think about that. Isn't that powerful? Remember when you got born again. Just think about it again when you got saved. So what does this world need? They have no hope. They don't need faith talked at them. Just believe, just believe. They don't have nothing to believe. What do they need? This is what our Christmas message is all about. We come, Jesus came to give us hope. He came to show a picture that just because the life that you're seeing, just because this, there's more to it than just this plain old earth. There's more. There is an eternity. There is the kingdom of heaven. There is darkness. But man, there is the kingdom of heaven that I came to give you, that I bought for you to get into. This is the message that you and I have, is hope. Okay, cool. So, and this is another phrase I want to throw out there. If you can't believe, for example, if you can't believe that you're healed, start hoping for it. What does that mean? You get a picture in front of you to start seeing yourself whole. 
And I, I'll use this example. I'll use it again this morning. Uh, you know, some friends of ours uh, in the States, uh, her mom was diagnosed with a pretty a terminal cancer that she had about three or four months to live. And so, I mean, be, being a word person that she is, she do- dove into the word. She started listening to a lot of these teachings. And the Lord specifically told her, I want you to get pictures of yourself from, you know, when you were younger age. And I want you to plaster them all over the house. Everywhere you go, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, wherever you are, I want you to throw pictures up of yourself. Why? She needed to get a picture rather than an 80-pound woman who's frail and looking ill. She needed to see a picture of herself strong when she was lifting up all these kids in her arms to see that again. Why? Because you need a picture to see so that your faith can latch hold to something. So what do you see? What picture are you seeing for your personal self, for your family, for the job that you have? God God needs your imagination. He needs you to start hoping so that your faith can latch onto it and just believe it. We make faith such a big deal and say, I gotta, I gotta make this work, I gotta make this. No, that's not what it is. Faith is automatic when hope is there. When you see a clear picture, you'll know what to do. Because how many times people think, okay, well, yeah, I believe, should I, should I throw my medicine away? Should I take off my glasses and drive? <laughs> right? Should I give my car away? If you have to ask those questions, you don't have a clear picture, don't do it. Don't. That's stupid. No, it's faith. No, it's stupid. Stupid. Thank you, Herb. Stupid. And you see people do that all the time. Well, I believe this is what this is what God wants me to do. And they just go give all this stuff away. Meanwhile, now you and your family are sleeping in a tent. Well, yeah, I believe God. No, you didn't. You believed your own self, thinking that God, faith is some magic wand that you just throw at God and he, kapoof, makes it work for you. No, you need a picture. And God will custom make a picture for you exactly where you're at. So let me encourage you, get a picture. You need hope. You, faith will be there. You need hope. You need that picture. And let me show you this, the power of imagination. Galatians 11, verse 6. I know you know these words, and before I read this, I want to just give you the definition for imagination. Imagination is the process of forming a mental image. It's a process. So you don't just go, "Mm, okay, I thought about that. I'm well now. Ding, yeah, I see it. And then you go about your day. No, it is a fixed gaze that you intentionally build on the inside of you. Because listen, when you see it, Oh man, nobody can talk you out of it. For example, your salvation. How many know that you are a child of God on your way to heaven? Can anybody talk you out of it? What are these so-called smart people out there that say, oh, you know, there's not really a God? Will they ever convince you otherwise? No, why? Because you see it. Because I see it. They can't take me off it. You can't take away my salvation. Why? Because I see Jesus on that cross. I saw him die and raise from the dead. You can't take that from me because it's mine. I see it. Well, the same way would be for your healing. The same way would be for your peace. The same way would be for the restoration of your family. Whatever it is, you need a picture. Get the picture up there, and that way you start. Nobody can tell you otherwise. Man, that's what the Word of God came to do. And only the Word can do that. Only the Word can do that. You can't just go, oh, I'm, go- I'm going to believe for one billion dollars. Listen, that's, that's, a great, that's great. Only if God reveals that to you. Okay, don't just get messed up and, you know, you know what I'm, do I got to explain that? Do I have, okay. I know we're really smart here, but, you know, just in case if there's online stuff, you know, there's, okay. So imagination, as I said, it's the process of forming a mental image. It's something not yet real or tangible, but you're forming, right? And here's the great, the cool thing is your creativity is hinged on your imagination. Did you know that you were created to be creative, Who made you? The creator. So therefore, we are creators. So again, let me just encourage you, get that image up. Get the imagination going again. If you've got an idea for a job or businesses or a way that you can reach the city in greater ways, get that imagination. It's God-given, right? And so in uh, Genesis 11, verse 6, and we know this to be the story of the Tower of Babel, God came down, and the people before that, I believe in verse 3, they say that, let us build a tower for ourselves, and let us make a name for ourselves. So they had this in their mind, that they're going to go now, and they're going to erect this huge tower, and it's, it's going to be theirs, and they're going to make a big name for themselves, and show us how, how amazing they are, they're going to put it to heaven. Well, in, here we are in verse 6, God comes down, and then he says, behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, 
And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And now, what's that word? Nothing they have, come on, they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. God is telling you and I what he sees as imagination is the most powerful thing that you and I could possess. Why? You are the only, you, as human beings, we are created in the image and likeness of God. Animals aren't dreaming to be what you have. Right? Your cat or your dog aren't sitting at home going, one day I'm going to master this house. They don't, they don't have that imagination. <laughs> if they did, shoot it. Like, you don't want that. That'd be a problem. <laughs> this is what you and I have. We have an imagination. Sorry, I didn't mean that in a, if you're an animal, I apologize. I didn't mean that in a rude way. I'm just saying, if they're trying to plan to take you out, then you got to take it out before. It, anyways, my imagination goes wild. I got to just, it's all good. <laughs> I always think of Pinky in the brain. What are we going to do today, Pinky? Take over the world. Well, I would shoot those mice long before they even thought about it. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> moving right along. We have this creative ability called imagination. You and I can imagine and see things come to pass from our imagination to present day. How many of you imagine something and now you're seeing it? Okay. For real. You, did you know, even before Jamie and I were pastoring this church, we had, it wasn't even in our mindset. No, I don't want to do that. But in 2012, Jamie and I were in Europe on our Europe trip, and the first time the Lord started speaking to us about it, we were sitting in Rome at a little cafeteria, a little cafe, because that's what you do. We were sitting there eating pizza, really, I think more, huh, more bulkier than that. But all of a sudden, those thoughts started coming about pastoring the church. And what had all of a sudden it dropped in our heart? Yeah, okay, I can start, I can actually start to see that. And it didn't happen until about three or four years later. But what did God do? He started to give the thoughts to it, give the imagination to it, because up to that time, I didn't see it. But now all of a sudden he started planting that on the inside of us. Now I could start to see it. And now that I saw it in here, now I see it here. So what is God asking you and I? He wants you and I to see it first. Hey, Pat, touch the eyes of your heart. This is something I do with my boys all the time. Boys, where's the, where, where are your eyes, your first set of eyes? And they'll go, where's your first set of ears? Right in here. Because when you see it, then you will see it. When you hear it, then you'll, you'll hear it. You first start on the inside. Everything God does is an inside job, remember? You've got to first see it on the inside. This is where it begins. I remember even in the sporting realm, this is something my dad did with us all the time on a regular basis. We drove up to Edmonton three or four times a week for soccer. And other than listening you know, to some radio stuff, he would say, hey, now, Joe, I want you to envision, see yourself doing in the game that you want to be doing. Okay, so I saw myself scoring goals. I saw myself knocking a few teeth out. I saw myself doing whatever I got to do to make sure nobody scored. I saw myself do that, right? How many of you have ever done that in sports or in dance or in gymnastics yeah <laughs> there it is thank you that's the word i'm looking for gymnastics <laughs> but before you do it you have to see it and it works and you actually hear athletes all along what do they practice doing they watch game film all the time why because they can see themselves doing things this is what they do right you just think that they just you know play one game a week no they watch game film throughout the week they're practicing what they just saw and now they're doing it again in game time it's that's just how this world works you first see it and then you see it you see it on the inside and so this is why god needs us to see that now my imagination is vital to me receiving from god and all that he has in store for me it's not up to god that i receive all that he has prepared for me god doesn't just go oh there you go there you go there you go that's not how he works. <laughs> it's not just up to him. I play a part in it. I have to see it with my imagination. I have to capture in my thoughts what it is that God has in store for me. What did God do with Abram? 75, he told him, hey, Abram, it's time for you to leave your mom and dad now. <laughs> Exit the house, right? Can you imagine Abram's dad? Abram, get out of bed, man. Let's, let's get going finally gets out of there but what did he tell abram i'm going to bring you to a place a land that's going to be for an inheritance for your for your people did it says abram didn't even know where he was going but before that abram saw it you can see that in hebrews 11 and then god promises hey you're going to be a father of many nations 
Okay, he was 75 when he first gave that promise. 75? I'll let you figure that out. You're going to have a baby. Say what now? Yeah, okay. So what did God do to make sure that Abram could see it? What did he tell him? Look up. Oh, what did he tell him to look at? Look at all the stars. Oh, man, do you see that? All the stars that you see there, guess what? That's going to be, your, your number of people coming from you are going to be even greater than the stars in the heavens. And then what did he say? Look down. Look at all the sand. What? You're going to have a greater inheritance of people than there are the sands on the earth. What's he doing? He's creating in Abram an imagination to see what God had in store for him. What God wants to show you, it's huge. So you have to start going, okay, Lord, I, I believe it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I, I simply believe it. This is one thing that the Lord spoke to me just this past week when we were in Palm Springs. He said, Joel, I'm in charge of the outcome. You're in charge of the process. A lot of times we get those things flipped that I'm trying to make the sand work. I'm trying to make babies like there are sand. It doesn't work. And you see Abram actually taking it into his own hands. And what did he do? Slept with Sarah's um, maid and they had a whole, they had an Ishmael. You do not want Ishmael's in your life. Don't. Try to make something happen for God. No, no, no. The outcome belongs to the Lord. The process belongs to me. My job is to keep that image in front of me and say, Lord, I believe that. Man, I'm thankful Abram stuck with it. How many of you grateful for that? Man, he's the father of our faith. I believe it. I see it. And he stuck with it all those 25 years. And then when he was 99 years old, Sarah had a baby. Could you imagine how pumped he was? All of a sudden, Sarah comes in, you know, bring the, the pregnancy test. Hey, Abram, guess what? You're going to be a dad. <laughs> Not a grandpa. You're going to be a dad. Ah, this whole party goes on. And he goes, wow. Okay. Now, as I said, <laughs> look at this. Look at Psalm 78, verse 41. I just think this is powerful. But, you know, God told, so this is leading up to, you know, Abram, and he gave birth to the Jewish nation. And God promised the Jewish nation, he promised Abram in a covenant, he said that I will give to you this land that we know now to be Israel today. This land belongs to you. It's an inheritance for you. And up to this time, you know, they went through slavery and all these types of things. And we know they were enslaved for 400 years to the Egyptians. And I want to just show you this verse because it says again and again, talking about the children of Israel here, what did they do? I need you guys to see these three words. They limited God. Did you know that you and I have the potential of limiting God in our life? By what? By our imagination. By thinking small. Dreaming small. Constantly living with, this is enough. This is, I, I don't need any more. God, He is so big that there is nothing that scares God in your imagination. You can't out-imagine what God has in store for you. Because he said, I came to give you life in abundance to the full till it overflows. That's the life he came to give you. So I mean, our imagination, we could kind of think, okay, this would be kind of a lot. Now God goes, there's more to it than that. So you can't scare God with your imagination. But look at this. Again and again, they limited God, preventing him from what? From blessing them. Who prevented God from blessing them? The children of Israel. It says, continually they turned back from him and they provoked the Holy One of Israel. Verse 42, it says, they forgot his great love. They forgot it. When you know what, um, um, the, even this morning when we were singing, just uh, uh, Psalm 103 was, quote, I, sorry, I can't remember who said that, but Nana was saying that, yeah, bless the Lord all my soul and forget not all of his benefits. Why not forget? You've got to keep it in the forefront of your thinking. You've got to constantly keep it in front of you. This is what he's done. I'm redeemed. He set me free. He heals all my diseases. He crowns me with love and tender mercy. My youth is renewed. He's trying to create an image. These people forgot his great love, how God took them by his hand, and with redemption's kiss, he delivered them from their enemies. They forgot all about that. So you actually see in Hebrews 3.19, it says that because of their unbelief, they could not enter into to his rest, even though it was already prepared for them. But what held them back? Their imagination. And I'll show you this, Numbers 13, 32. This is right after the Israelites. They spied out the land that God gave to them. Remember that story? Remember that? All the, God gave them this promised land, and now Moses said, hey, I'm going to send 12 spies. Go look at the land that God's going to give us. 
So these 12 spies go out and they come back. Two of them are like, let's go. Ten of them went and said they saw, uh, they brought the Israelites an evil report of the land, which they had scouted out saying the land through which we want to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Click. They, there we saw the Nephilim or the giants, the son of Zanuck, who come from the giants, and we were in our own sight. How did they see themselves? Like a grasshopper. And so they said, and because we see ourselves that way, I'm sure they saw us the same way. And did you know, if you find out later, and if you read Joshua, the, God, or the book of Joshua, it actually talks about these giants, the sons of Anak, they heard about the Israelites, and they were frightened of them. You see that with Jericho. Right? Man, Rahab tells him, oh, the, these people are scared of you. They, they heard what God did for you in Egypt. And meanwhile, these guys are thinking we're grasshoppers in our own sight. So what's holding back the promises of God is the picture you have of yourself. This is what was happened to me. This is what was done to me. This is what somebody says about me. All these things are trying to be an image creator to your life. Did you know that the devil can't take anything from you? He can't. He has no acts. He can't come into your life and just say, give me that. So what does he do? He comes with thoughts. He comes with ideas to get you off of who you really are in Christ Jesus. And he says, this is your past. This is what you've done. This is what's said about you. This is where you were born. This is the city that you live in now. This is the culture you grew up in. You are no good. And as long as he can keep you thinking that way, the result is you see yourself, your faith will never work. And we go, How come I've been, I'm praying and believe God. No, you didn't have a picture. I've talked to so many people. I prayed and it didn't work. No wonder it didn't work. You don't have a clear picture. If I lay hands on you, will you be well? Huh? It'd be nice. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. Why? Because you don't see it. You got to see it. And this is why people kind of think God's some sugar daddy. This is not who he is. He's very intentional. He needs you to get that picture in front of you so that he has something to work with. This is why God's not saying, you don't see it, I'm giving it to you. He needs you to see it so that you can lay hold of the promise through faith and patience that I stay the same. Why? Because I see myself. I see myself. I see myself preaching to a thousand. I see myself preaching to two thousand. I see myself doing it. And you hold on. And you hold on. This is what we do. And even the properties that we have now, what God's been doing in me is birthing the vision to see it. It doesn't just randomly appear. You've got to have pictures for it. <laughs> we're going to take up this whole area whether you like it or not this is what we're doing <laughs> we're going to go for it we're going to take it all over why because god needs it it's not to build impact life church far from it what are we trying to do we're here to build a kingdom and what are we against we're against everything the kingdom of darkness tries to do so the more that we have the more influence god is able to have that's what we are after and that's what we're all a part of together so this is like the same way that we see in, you know, Genesis eleven six, that those people, the Tower of Babel, right? They, because they have one thought, one mind, nothing will be impossible what they have imagined. Imagine if this group of believers right here in our Saturday night group and people online, you hook up with us and you start seeing what God wants to do in this area, taking over these lands and what we can do to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. Just start, and I mean, we're going to be training more and more vision to it, but I want you to help us. Don't just go, oh, is that, do you need more? Yes. <laughs> Why? It's for the purpose of Jesus. It's not about having more. It's about being intentional with what we got. I mean, we've already maxed this place out. <laughs> we use it all the time. It's time, we, that, thank God he gave us those things, but we are here with an assignment. Yeah, so do you have to go after those ones? Absolutely. You bet your sweet butt we do. And we're going to continue to go for it. So what, as we present more and more, I just, I want to encourage you, don't go, ah, uh, no, go, yeah, man, I'm in. Yeah. Even though if you don't quite see it yet, just stick with the picture. This is what we are for. <laughs> okay, amen. That was verse free. Okay. Now, let's look at here real quick. Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to show you, this is the same thing that Jesus did for you and I. Jesus uses this principle of imagination. Did you know that? Go figure. <laughs> the creator himself uses his imagination. And talk about this. As for us, uh, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. And I want to encourage you, if you want to have a good study, go through Hebrews 11 and look at all the men and women of God that we call heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 and look how, what the promise God gave them and what they did to hold on to it, to see it come to pass in their life. Some of them, they saw it, 
here, but they never saw it. Abraham being one of them. He saw the city, that, he saw the city of God here, but he never lived enough, long enough to actually see it manifested. Now, I think we need to have that same, uh, that if I'm not even just going to see it here, it's going to be for another generation. That's good preaching. It's more than just what we want in our life. It's for the next group that's behind us yet that need to know Jesus and they see it. It's we're building on generations. We're here to impact generations for Jesus. So what we're doing is we're building for the next ones. We're not building for us anymore. We're building for the guys behind us that need to take this on. That's why we need this. Because how we reach people today is way different than it was 20 years ago. Way different. So we're going to need some different stuff. And God's like, great, go for it. I don't have a problem with that. Anyway. Verse 2. Let's just go there for a sec. Jesus, we look away from all the natural realm and we fasten our gaze. You fasten your gaze. You fasten your eyes. What is he talking about? My heart. My, my, the eyes of my heart. I fasten the eyes of my heart onto Jesus. How do I fasten my eyes onto Jesus when I can't see him? I go to his word. I fasten my eyes onto his word who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example, now we'll notice this, this is the example of Jesus is this, because his heart was focused, say focused, he saw something. His heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. What did he do? He saw the cross, but you know what really he did? He looked beyond that. So he kind of put it in his, he saw it, but he looked past it, and he saw you and me. And it says, for the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation. And now he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. What did Jesus do in his imagination? He saw you. Because was I born at that time? No, I wasn't. But he looked past and he saw generation upon generation and he said, it is worth every soul. How did he do it? He saw it. That's why they hung him on the cross. And he could have called out for an angel and 100,000 angels couldn't have come and wiped out a whole radius of miles. But he didn't do it because he saw it. So look at verse 3. So consider. So what does it mean to consider? To go back. To constantly remember. Kind of what Nana was saying again. Remember. Remember carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in, or cave in under life's pressures. What does he want you to do? Christians, we don't cave in when it gets tough. What do we do? We fix our gaze on what Jesus said in his word and what he promised us. Why are people freaking out about the new prime minister we got? It's because they don't have a picture. Everything's going to go under. It's against Alberta. Maybe it is, but you should have a picture that holds you steady of what your father told you. This is the word. This is what we do as believers. So let me encourage you. You don't have a faith problem. You got a hope problem. You got to see something. <laughs> My family, they're going to be fine. People are nervous about having kids. They don't want to raise them in this day and age. Forget about it, man. I see a picture of my children walking with me, serving the Lord hand in hand. You get that picture and nothing can sway you from it because you got promises. Amen. Now, and uh, this was kind of different from this last night. Actually, I'll get there in a sec, sorry. So what are you keeping in your mind's eye? Because Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what picture do you have of yourself? Just bring it down even on a smaller scale. How do you see you? Do you see yourself making an impact in this city? Let's make it even smaller. Do you see making yourself an impact in the family that you're in? Can you see that? The job that you're in. Let me encourage you. If you want to start seeing a greater... Man, start seeing yourself. I'm a red deer impactor. This is what I do. This is who I am. Everywhere I go, I impact. And start seeing yourself sharing the gospel. See yourself with praying people in the mall. Start seeing yourself doing these types of things. Because when you see it, <laughs> you see it. Because there's been times, I honestly, I've seen the service before the service actually happens. I see from the pulpit what I'm going to share. I see all of that first here, and then when it comes, I go, oh, I've, I've already done that. You already see it. Well, it's the same way in the kingdom of God. Start seeing yourself laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. See it. Mark 16 says that if I lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Meditate on that. Get that picture going, these are the hands. 
that God is going to work through. I lay hands on people and they will be healed. What does God need? He needs you to see it. <laughs> oh man, are you kidding me? This is good news for y'all today. We're not just these weak Christians just hoping to get by. No, God's saying, get a picture. Start to see this again. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> Now, this is what was on my heart this morning, and I want to just finish with this. For some of you, it, it's not too late to believe again. It's not too late to hope again. And the way that the Lord shared this to me was actually just the, the Lazarus outcome. Some of you, your hearts are shut like the tomb of Lazarus. They're shut in. And what was Lazarus at the time? He's a dead man that was brought into this tomb. They rolled a big stone over it, and that, that was it. And I want to just read you a couple of thoughts that I had. But what are areas in your life that you thought were too late? Oh, I did have this dream back when I was, you know, younger. Or I had this dream, but, you know, this happened in my life. And I went through something nasty in my family. I went through a divorce or, you know, something happened to my kids. But what is that one thing that you could think of and you're thinking it may be too late? Or I want to, what I want you to do is I want to bring Jesus to your Lazarus tomb. Because every one of us have a Lazarus in our life where we go, that's something stinky, it's something that brings apathy when I think about it. It brings frustration, it brings hopelessness, it brings hurt. Whenever I walk to the tomb, and I mean just for, I mean, I'll do this message another time. But you know, every time they didn't want to bring, you know, Mary didn't want to bring Jesus to the tomb of Lazarus. Lord, it stinks. The Lord's not afraid of stink. <laughs> He doesn't get concerned about that. This was a dream that I had, Lord, but this is the outcome of my life. I, you know, I got pregnant too early. I, I, you know, I, di I did it wrong. Or, yeah, I had an abortion. Or I, I, I made all these mistakes. This, and so what you got is you now have a tomb rock over that cell of your heart. And God's wanting to do He wants to call that thing forth. What did He do? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Come up. And you see, if you read it in John chapter 11, that Lazarus is as the dead man came out. What does God want to do? Who is he? He is the God of our resurrection. Not just these bodies, but also your dreams. That's who he is. He's the God of your dreams, and he'll resurrect those dreams again. Come on, say it with me. He resurrects those dreams. This is what he does. He is in the resurrection business. So nothing is too late. Nothing is too far gone. This is, oh man, I made that mistake. Forget about it. That may have happened, yes. Rather than let that be your point where you just break and crumble, let that be the place now where you go, this is what happened to me, but God, who is so good, who is so rich in mercy, He brought this Lazarus out of this tomb again. And now rather than hiding it in shame, I now boldly proclaim this is who my God is. And watch the amount of people that come flocking to you because they need that testimony. They need it. This world needs to hear hope. And what is that? Yeah, it's what the goodness of God, but it's because you're creating a picture. So whatever it is, no matter how low it may be, just find what's the next step. What, what can I see? What's my next step? Maybe, it's, maybe you're believing God for a godly spouse. Well, just start and all of a sudden start seeing yourself being that godly person that you're looking for. Start there. Amen? Okay. And this is what the Lord said to me, but open the tomb of your life up again. The voice of Jesus always calls out the Lazarus in my life. Jesus always shows up at the tomb of Lazarus in my life. He always shows up. <laughs> Come on, he always shows up. Can we all stand up together? I'm, I'm done. Hey, thanks for listening. If you live in the central Alberta region of Canada, we would love to have you come out and check out one of our weekend messages. For more info on all of our directions, service times, and children's programs, visit our website at impactlife.ca. That's impactlife.ca.